You're listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. Hello, I'm Flight Lieutenant Peter Lisney, and in this episode, we'll talk about the law of armed conflict in space and cyber. We'll also reheat a few stories, just in case you missed them. But first, see if you can identify this noise. Find out if you're right at the end of this episode. Now, can you respond to a cyber attack with force? And do laws on Earth extend into space? I spoke with squadron leaders Kieran and Stu from RAF Legal Services to find out how LOAC, or the Law of Armed Conflict, applies in space and cyber. There has been resistance from some states to accept that um, the Law of Armed Conflict would apply uh, to the cyber context. If there was an armed conflict that extended um, to that basis, the satellite was was contributing to the conflict in some way, then you, you've got a distinction question that you need to answer. That is the, the, the biggest weakness of international law. That's why you get international relations scholars basically say there is no such thing as international law. Hi, I'm Squadron Leader Kieran. I'm currently a military professor at the Stockland Centre for International Law at the US Naval War College, where uh, one of the things that I, I do is teach international law relevant to airspace and cyber domains to the students here. Uh, and in a personal capacity, I am a core expert to something called the WUMA manual, which is going to clarify international law as it relates to military space operations. Hi, everyone. I'm Squadron Leader Stu. Uh, my recent focus has been in relation to space activities and forming, following the formation of uh, Space Command in the UK, I've been assigned as the legal advisor uh, to that command um, and also have a background more recently in advising on uh, or advising the headquarters at Air Command in relation to operational matters. Yeah, before we get going on, on, the, uh, on the detail and then the questions, just one thing to clarify is that uh, any opinions offered here are very much uh, the opinions of Stu or, or me in a personal capacity and don't reflect that of necessarily of the government uh, or the Royal Air Force. Welcome to Inside Air. It's really good to have you on the show. So today we're going to talk about the law of armed conflict and how that applies to space and cyber. Is there a distinction between space and cyber? I, I think space, I think satellites, I think cyber, I think of the laptop on my desk. What's the difference? Yeah, so <clears throat> from, from a legal perspective, there's definitely a difference, but um, I think we can also get a bit overblown with, with the, the distinction, certainly from, a, from an operational perspective, because when we think about satellites, basically they are computers that orbit the Earth, um, and they're controlled from ground stations that are, rely on, on um, cyberspace. Uh, and conversely, increasingly cyber infrastructure relies on space capabilities. So you think about SpaceX and its um, purported aim to deliver internet to parts of the world that you know struggles for internet coverage. So there's, there is this symbiotic relationship, you know, they rely on each other. Why is the uh, Royal Air Force legal branch interested in space and cyber? Maybe you can tell us about, uh, about the RAF legal branch and, and your role. Yeah, so in, in terms of the, the, the legal branch, it's known by two names, which is instantly a, a red herring. Uh, we're both the RAF legal branch, also known as the Directorate of Legal Services within the RAF. And it's effectively a branch made up of professionally qualified solicitors and barristers. Uh, we're qualified before we come into service, before joining up, and we come from quite diverse legal backgrounds and experiences. There's about 40 of us in total, uh, uniformed, both full-time and reserves, uh, who seek to, to deliver operationally focused legal services to the RAF and wider defence. So that's the kind of background that we come into and effectively what we're seeking to do is ensuring that the activities undertaken by RAF or wider defence are legally compliant. You know, we're paid by the Air Force to advise the Royal Air Force as an organisation. Um, you know, we're not paid to uh, advise on uh, individual service members' legal issues such as, you know, 
divorces, convincing of your house, you know, uh, your neighbours kicked your dog, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is. Uh, that's not our job. Um, so we we would advise station co commanders, for example, on on disciplinary offences. Uh, if they basically commanding officers have the ability to to hear those types of offences, um, but if they're sufficiently serious, they have to get passed up to service prosecution authority. So that's the kind of disciplinary criminal side, uh, and then we give general advisory. Um, we, get, we do general advisory work, so advising on you know, service complaints, service inquiries, those types of things. Uh, and a big part of what we do is advising on operational law. So we've got posts at NATO. Um, you know, we we have people out in Ali Deed, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We have an operational law office, um, and Stu, you know, is now the the inaugural space uh, command lawyer. So congratulations, Stu. So you know, we we Operational is a big part of what we do, uh, and, that, and that's the most unique part of what we do. You know, you don't come out of a civilian job uh, with any experience of advising on the law of armed conflict. You have, we have to train our legal officers to be competent in that area. Right. Okay. So, yeah, this is new territory for you when you join the Royal Air Force. Uh, we've we've probably all seen films, Eye in the Sky, and so forth, where you you, you see legal advisors in an operational capacity. Is is that accurate? That sort of film, assuming you've seen. <laughs> yeah. So, so bef I'll start, uh, Stuart for me. So, before I deployed, um, actually, that movie had come out fairly recently, and and um, <laughs> I was trying to explain to my mum what I would do, what I would be doing, and that was that was about the closest thing I could find that would, would be an easy reference point. Um, I would say that that movie's fifty percent accurate, fifty percent, um, you know, completely inaccurate in terms of what we're, we're expected to do in theatre. You're advising uh, sometimes a very dynamic situation, um, and, and it depends on the timing of the campaign and, and how much is going on. But the most important thing, really, is when you firstly when you start out in theatre, is to sort of build that relationship with your your targeting team, the commanding officer, the targeteer, uh, intelligence officers, etc., so that you're sort of all working uh, towards the same aim. And the key word that you've used there is advice. You're in an advisory capacity. You're not making decisions. Is that right? Yes, I'd say that's that's very accurate. And, and going with what Kieran said, th those movies are great, I think, for highlighting and bringing to the public perception um, some of the, the activities that are carried out, albeit they may be not directly relating to the exact reality. But it very much is that case of advising um, not making the decisions and uh, that's where building relationships is really key to the work we do. Uh, perhaps now is a good time to talk about the uh, laws of armed conflict because fundamentally that's your role to uh, advise on the uh, laws of armed conflict. Could you take me back to Cranwell, take me to Shrivenham and remind me what the framework is that you uh, work to? Sure, so I mean, typically... As a starter for ten, as it were, we, we talk about four basic principles, um, and there, there are pluses and minuses to that approach. But but that's the one that most people are, are, are most familiar with. So we talk about uh, military necessity, we talk about humanity, we talk about distinction, and we talk about proportionality. Um, and it's not self-evident what those things necessarily mean. Um, so when we talk about military necessity, we're basically saying that states can do things in war um, where there's you know. A, an operational need for it, um, but, but but where there isn't that operational need, uh, you can't go beyond that line and uh, without breaching the law of armed conflict. Uh, and one of the, one of the and and really, uh, humanity and military necessity are, are kind of uh, there's a balance between them that's necessary in the law. Um, and distinction is such a key key aspect to, to the law of armed conflict. Uh, and, and what that is is. It's permitted in war or, or an armed conflict to target combatants, uh, to target civilians only where they're directly participating in hostilities. Uh, in non-international armed conflicts, so a conflict between a state and a non-state actor, there are no such thing as combatants in terms of the, the adversary that you're, you're facing. So you, you can only target members of an organized armed group or again, civilians who are directly participating in hostilities. Then in terms of objects, uh, you can only target military objectives and there, there's a, a long definition in Article 52.2 of Additional Protocol 1, which I won't bore you with, but it basically boils down to does that object effectively contribute to, to your enemy's military action and if you were to destroy it or neutralise it, does it offer you a definite military advantage? So that's the distinction. Um, so that's the kind of the basics. So I was chatting to a colleague recently and he was talking to me about the law of armed conflict and he said to me, 
it's really difficult to understand. And he, he wasn't sure whether the law is there to protect the individual or the reputation of the organisation or to reduce legal challenge. What advice would you have for that person? Yeah, perhaps building on and at the risk of agreeing with Kieran too, too strongly, I think it, it is really key that you've, you have you can set out lots of different frameworks to look at the applicable rules. Some of the difficulty is actually identifying the relevant rules that apply to a specific situation. And then when you've, you've done that, it's applying those rules to the, the context so that you can arrive at your answer. Um, as such, there's, there's quite a lot of different sources of law that you can turn to and how the, the military seeks to, to try and operationalise that is by providing operational documents that have the law as part of them, together with policy considerations and also operational considerations, which tries to bring it slightly to life and apply it to that context so that decisions aren't made on the ground um, or, or in action there and then. I think in terms of what you said there, I mean, ultimately what, what Law Act's trying to do is, is kind of balance all those different elements together. So it's providing states with um, an idea of how they're going to be held responsible for actions that are undertaken, but also there's an individual element to that. Um, and very much what we're seeking to do is comply with those rules, because if everybody's complying with the rules that are understood and are agreed to, they're voluntarily agreed to by states, then it ensures that, that, that everyone's playing from the same rulebook. Yeah, that that opens the door to something else, and that is uh, when, you know, recent conflicts, we've been working as part of a coalition force with uh, uh, multiple nations. What is your experience of the differing nature of law of armed conflict between different nations and how they interpret rules? Has that ever been a hindrance or a benefit to you operationally? So there is definitely a, a difference between states for, for a variety of reasons. The first reason is that um, when you talk about international law, states are bound by rules that are either set out in treaties, so you sort of written down, like equivalent to a contract really, um, or customary law, which is state practice over a period of time, which is accepted as international law. So. You know, we're, we're from the Royal Air Force. When we talk about ops, often we're focusing on targeting, uh, whereas the Army might be a little bit more focused on detention, but also targeting, of course, as well. So when we're thinking about targeting, the the main treaty is the uh, something I mentioned earlier, the additional protocol uh, to the Geneva Conventions of 1977. And that treaty is uh, the UK um, as a party to, but the US is not, Israel is not, Turkey is not, um, and people, and some states like Iran are not. Most states are, but, but clearly some are not. So there you've got the kind of first distinction. We are we signed up to some treaty rules that the uh, US are our main ally is not. A second uh, reason there might be variance is just how we interpret those rules. Uh, and an example of that is when you're looking at what's a military objective, so what objects can I blow up, to put it, <laughs> to put it in simple terms. Um, the US uh, has this interpretation of uh, war sustaining. And what that basically boils down to it's an object that uh, economically uh, provides support to your adversary you can you can target um, and not every state would agree with that um, certainly a number of european states would say that it, that goes beyond what you're entitled to do when you're looking at military objectives so that's the separate reason you might have a, a difference um, a third reason which has become increasingly important in the last 10 15 years is hum international human rights law now the uk is a party to european convention on human rights uh, we have a Human Rights Act, which helps incorporate those provisions into, into domestic law. And obviously, the US is not a party to European Convention on Human Rights. Um, so to, to the extent that that um, human rights law is applicable in the operations, there's another difference there. Um, then to go to your, to your point about does that cause uh, issues, um, it, obviously, it's not ideal. But as long as uh, different states understand where where the kind of line is and what uh, others can do, then I don't think it becomes too big an issue. Um, but that that then requires the, to be that relationship building and expectation management. What are the implications then for our troops that might be under the command of uh, another nation's uh, commander? Troops on the ground or our air crew prosecuting a target, uh, but their direct line of command is another nation. Does that put them in a difficult position? And how, how do we mitigate those potential conflicts of uh, interpretation of law? Yeah, I think that maybe goes back to what, what I said earlier as well. So I think what you've got to do is 
is work out and, and embed um, in different um, in different states. Military organisations is obviously a very common theme, especially how operations are conducted. So, completely agree that that it certainly is an issue. It's partly partly dealt with through the way that we operationalise the documents to to bake in uh, international law and into the exercises that we we do or the activities that we undertake during a conflict and ultimately what you're seeking to do there is is make sure that you understand the chain and who ultimately is responsible for the decision that is made. In terms of having UK personnel embedded with another organisation, it's then understanding those those rules that are are appearing in the operational documents and working out which one applies at what different times. So as much as they might be contributing, who's making the final decision, who's going to be responsible for different aspects uh, within that particular operation. Yeah, and it comes up in, in a variety of, of uh, different flavours. So when I was out in the last time I was out in the CAOC, um, the, the director of the CAOC was basically, it's on rotation and it was a UK one star at the time. So there was, uh, on the odd occasion, I got asked to come up and advise him because he was you know, essentially directing US operations at times. So it, it, it does come up in practice a fair bit. The RAF currently uses piloted aircraft, but it also uses unmanned aerial vehicles. Are there any differences in the way that you apply law to an unmanned aerial vehicle, a UAV? So I don't know about, I don't know about you, Steve, but um, my answer to this is always no. Um, it, it's The only difference is the pilot's um, a, a, a far greater distance from the, from the vehicle that, that's that they're actually flying. Um, I mean, often we're using it as a weapons platform. So um, you know, it's either an, an intelligence platform or it's, it's a weapons platform, and, and that's the same as a, as a fast jet. But when you're thinking about the law of armed conflict and, and drones and inverted commas, uh, they really don't give rise to a whole host of of um, different issues. Yeah, and I, I, sort of, and I, th- I think the, the the point there is that. Yeah, I completely agree. The, the rules that you're applying probably aren't changing um, in terms of what ca- capability, but the operational factors. Uh, so if you're if there's a way that you can can take those precautions and attack uh, using a different platform, it might might offer some advantages over a manned platform. But potentially give you thinking time as well uh, to uh, decide what the right advice would be to give your commander uh, absolutely yeah from my experience i mean if, if you're sat in the in the count for example and you're able to you know see the the feed from a reaper or, or whatever else then and direct chat from from the crew then there is that um level of information that you're getting in that it that can be quite useful in terms of getting getting you thinking ahead of time so okay well something seems to be might be happening here so what, what do i need to think about etc We've talked about the law of armed conflict, uh, let's say, with uh, you know recent conflicts and the conventional way of operating, but everyone's aware of the cyber threat and whether that's direct or indirect in terms of influence. How does the law of armed conflict uh, apply to the world of cyber? What is a a valid target and what isn't? Over to you, Steve. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Kieran. <laughs> I think as a, a kind of starting point, there's. You've probably got to get to the position where you understand that that body of law applies um, as a matter of fact or matter of course to your operations. So what the the, the position probably would, would be is that as a, a matter of law, international hum, uh, humanitarian law or law act applies as a matter of course to s- cyber operations. And um, what you've got to probably then work out is how it applies in that context. Um, so. The, as Kieran's quoted as well, the additional Protocol 1 to the Geneva Conventions from 1977 was probably established at a time when these technologies and this infrastructure, cyber infrastructure wasn't particularly uh, commonplace. And therefore, what you've got to do is apply those rules in a, in a kind of different setting. So some of those terms, legal terms of art that exist within that context become slightly more difficult to apply and interpret. But what we can't say, I don't think, is that it doesn't apply and therefore it's a completely lawless place. We've got a body yeah, of it's law. Also, that, sorry. I was just going to jump in, Steve. Um, although, unfortunately, you do say there have been um, an ongoing kind of group of governmental experts that have been dealing with cyber and, and um, legal issues. And there has been resistance from some states to accept that um, the law of armed conflict would apply uh, to the cyber context. Uh, there are parallels also in, in space. So, you know, the, obviously the precursor to, to any of, of, 
uh, thinking about how it applies is does it apply? Um, and we've never had a conflict that has extended into outer space. You know, satellites have provided a huge amount of capability in in warfare, but there hasn't. You know, hostilities haven't extended into space. So if that's the case, we don't and we don't have a specific treaty dealing with it, and we don't have any custom. On what basis can we say that low Earth applies in outer space? Uh, and and there's and the simple answer is it, is it does. Um, so uh, historically, this body of law would basically apply when states declared war against each other. The problem with that is that if states didn't declare war, we suggested that body of law doesn't apply with all the protections that affords the civilians. So what happened is after World War II is the Geneva Conventions of 1949 uh, are established and every state is a party to these conventions. And what that did is it put the law of armed conflict on an objective footing. So basically, if there is you know, hostilities between states, it doesn't matter what states say, the law of armed conflict would apply. Um, and there's nothing to suggest that wouldn't extend to any other domain. And in fact, we've got uh, jurisprudence, so case law from the International Court of Justice uh, in the Nuclear Weapons Advisory Opinion, where they basically say the law of armed conflict applies to all weapons now, uh, past and future. Um, so we've got good legal basis for, for accepting that that is the case. Unfortunately, some states are resistant to that, and you can make of that what, what, what you will. With the four principles of the laurels of armed conflict, uh, one of them being humanity, if we take the, the space context, if you've got an adversary's satellite and it's a legitimate target as far as it's causing harm. If that satellite is unmanned, satellites are not manned, so there's no human on board. In theory, could you shoot that satellite down and what would you be thinking about? What are the implications as far as those four principles are concerned? And I think humanity is going to be an interesting point. I think in terms of humanity, and this maybe goes back to the earlier point about the framework that you approach to look at how LOAC applies, it might not be the, the principle that comes to mind straight away, I think. Um, some of the other rules that you would need to consider, I think, for instance, would be your, your distinction. So is that an object that you can attack, the distinction being between a military objective compared to a civilian objective, and it's a, a point that's established quite clearly that, that satellites it can perform a number of functions. If you just look at, for instance, GPS, then clearly when we're talking about targeting, then they have a military function and the way that precision um, munitions are guided. But clearly GPS and the activities that we carry out in our day-to-day -day lives also has quite a key role. So in terms of distinction, you've got, the, and, and if there was an armed conflict that extended um, to that basis, the satellite was, was contributing to the conflict in some way, then you, you've got a distinction question that you need to answer um, and be satisfied that, that in the circumstances ruling at the time that object is making an effective contribution uh, and therefore can be targeted. Um, I'll pause and let Kieran come in if he's got any points on there. Yeah so we, we talk about the principles and they're, they're great as a prescriptive shorthand and to get people thinking about the overall conflict but ultimately if you're a commander you need to know the specific rules um, and that's why you have people like Stu, you know, in Space Command, uh, et cetera, that can advise on that. So when we're thinking about the specific rules in that in that context, well, assuming you, first of all, assuming you've got the operational capability to, to, to destroy that satellite, the first thing is it a legitimate target? And Stu's dealt, you know, dealt with that. Is it is it a military objective? If it's a, something like a GPS satellite, a communication satellite um, that's helping the military, you're going to get there fairly quickly. You then think about precautions. Okay, so I could blow this up in space. That's going to create create a lot of de debris or debris. Sorry, I've been in America too long now. Um, so um, you see in 2007, a Chinese uh, defunct weather satellite was blown up as a weapons test and it created a, sh a lot of de debris, or debris, um, the largest event uh, in history, essentially. Um, and because the altitude at which that, that um, kinetic uh, event took place, um, the, uh, the fragmentation is gonna stay there for centuries. Yeah, and that poses a threat to any objects because the way that um, debris propagates, it spreads out from the specific orbit that satellite's in and poses a hazard to, to, to all objects in low Earth orbit where, where, that, where, where the satellite was. So if you think about that in the context of, of an armed conflict, um, and we think about precautions and attack, as mentioned earlier, in the context of drones, well, can I achieve the same effect in less destructive fashion, i.e., can I electronically jam the capability that satellite provides? Can I um, use cyber capabilities, remote access tools to, let's say, turn? So satellites will have things like we call, we call payloads. 
So its its function might be to observe the Earth, or it might be to provide cap um, communications capability through transponders. If I can t turn that off or point the point the um, you know the uh, the electric optical sensor away from where it's supposed to be, then basically you've just got a, a floating bit of metal that isn't providing the service I need. So can I do that? Achieve the same effect and not create all that um, debris in space. So that's that's a question for precautions. And then finally, when you think about targeting, you've got proportionality, and that is, is this is the advantage I'm anticipating? Um, you have to judge that against the civilian harm you're expecting. And 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 if the civilian harm is excessive, that is a disproportionate attack. Now, in space, as you mentioned, satellites don't have mothers. So then the question is, well, how far down the line do I have to think? For example, if I were to blow up GPS satellites, um, and that were to have an effect on Earth, how you know, and how foreseeable is it that I might kill and injure people in the long term, or what effect I might have? So you do get you do get into some pretty difficult questions. As far as cyber is concerned, uh, you may not be able to uh, explain what you can target and what you can't target but what are the peculiarities of uh, cyber as far as your legal approach is concerned so obviously the, the focus so far of our discussion has been the law of armed conflict and I'll, I'll definitely get into that uh, and Stu can get into that too um, but when we're talking about cyber and international law and national law we need to think particularly as the military is getting increasingly involved in um, what sometimes referred to as below the zone uh, type activities. You know, what is what is what are the international rules that govern that type of, of activity? So um, we obviously have the UN Charter, and you can't use um, you can't use force in your international relations. So if you were to, you know, let's take an example, real world Stuxnet, and let's assume assume arguendo, or for the purpose of this discussion, um, that you know that was uh, an activity that undertaken by a state. And those um, centrifuges were, were damaged. Does that give rise to a prohibited use of force under the UN Charter? Uh, take it, taking a step back, what about election interference? So it's you know it's it's on the record that in the 2016 US elections that uh, that the Russians basically uh, tried to interfere to, to varying degrees in the in the election there. Uh, so well, what are the rules in international law that govern that type of activity? Uh, and there's a rule of non-interference non or non-intervention. Um, and basically what that says is that uh, states aren't, uh, can't engage in coercive measures that uh, interfere with the domain reservoir, uh, a reservoir, sorry, or, uh, or basically the kind of activities that are exclusively um, of the sovereign state. So an election being an obvious example. So if, if there were to be a, um, hacking into election, in an election system and a change in the vote, that would clearly be a breach of international law. What about if we're posting things on social media that's trying to change and influence people's attitudes, or you know, or, or fake news in a verse of commas? You know, where, where's the line on sort of a breach of international law there? So that's the kind of the the, um, the kind of peacetime question. Then going back to the law of armed conflict, um, you get into some interesting questions like we talked about uh, in terms of military objectives. So is data an object? If I were to go into your system and alter data, and that were to have an effect on your pensions record, so you know your your civilian population, you know loses all of, all the pension data, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is that is that a, a breach of it, the law of armed conflict, or is that something that is not properly regulated yet? What I want to understand is, uh, if if an adversary uh, takes a particular action that uh, is harmful to another state uh, financially, uh, it could be data, uh, but it could be, you know, a significant financial impact. Is it within the law to respond with uh, kinetic force? And put it bluntly, can you respond with a bomb? Yeah, so you, you've almost answered, uh, asked, sorry, the, the classic exam question there. So um, I'll, I'll give you a, a nine out of 10 for the, the actual question. Um, so yeah, that, that's one of the main main areas of discussion. Um, okay, let's let's paint a scenario here that draws out various things. So you're not in a war. You have a group of uh, hackers operating from a state, and they basically take down your stock exchange, and that causes a sort of credit to to slow down, like we saw 
in 2007 and you know has a major impact on your your economy so the question there is does that amount to a to a use of force but the, the actual question you have to ask yourself before that is is that an act attributable to a state um so we, we're getting to questions of attribution now uh, under customary international law as a sort of starting position the acts of individuals and companies are not attributable to a state however if a state were to instruct direct or control the actions of those hackers those actions of the hackers would be deemed under international law to be the actions of the state that is instructing direct or control the activity. So then you've got this attribution question that you've answered. And the question then is, okay, we've got, this is attributable to the state. Has that state engaged in an unlawful use of force? And Stuart, I don't know what your view is on that kind of taking down a stock exchange, et cetera. Yeah, so I think the attribution point is really key to address. You've both got your, your legal attribution as well as your your technical or factual attribution that kind of feeds into that assessment, which is really key. And it's probably become it's probably more complex in the spheres of cyber and space than it would be in the conventional. You can see troops on the ground, um, but within the cyber or space domain things are or the situational awareness is perhaps slightly less and that can kind of muddy the waters. As Kieran kind of outlined, you're then having to consider what thresholds are relevant. And you've got the, the use of force is the kind of the most obvious one. Again, I think there's probably quite a lot of uncertainty and debate that exists as to, to where that threshold would be met. Um, and, it, and, and even when met, um, you, you, you've then got other questions as to what your response options would be. And that's one of the key aspects, I think, of international law, whereby it provides an, a legitimate response option for states. There's quite a lot of discussion uh, in relation to uh, norms of behaviour. So that would be voluntary, politically binding norms, but not necessarily legally binding norms. And where international law seeks to provide it is, is offering legitimate response options. So if we're saying that a use of force has occurred and it amounts to uh, what would a, or what could be defined as an armed attack, um, it would give rise to the, the option to respond in self-defence and that's something that international law would, would specifically allow in those certain circumstances. Um, yeah, and Stu's, Stu's used the magic words there on attack. And going back to your point earlier about you know, differences between states, so the, the US is, if not in a u- unique position, certainly one of the only few states to, to say that um, a use of force and an armed attack are the same thing. But, but most... Um, states and, and international lawyers would say that um, you would have to suffer an armed attack, a use of force is something less than that. So the question would be, if you wanted to use a bomb to respond to um, a cyber activity, then you'd have to characterize that as an armed attack. Um, but if that is the case, um, and you're, and it's necessary and proportionate to, to respond with you know bomb or multiple bombs, then yes, you are legally entitled to. You don't have to respond from a cyber attack with cyber to cyber, space to space. Uh, that That's not a legal requirement. So after you've given your advice to the commander and the commander's taken that advice and dropped the bomb or pressed the button, moved the mouse, whatever it is that they've had to do to uh, make that action, who is the TMO or the VAR as far as warfare is concerned? Who is it who arbitrates what you do and the decisions that you make, uh, the advice you give rather? First of all, I have to go on the record and saying I hate VAR. Um, <laughs> I think it's it's how, you, now you celebrate a, a goal and you have to wait uh, two minutes to check if your celebration was correct or not. Yeah, I hate it. It turns if it, it, in an international legal context, it's a great question because that is the, the the biggest weakness of international law, and that's why you get international relations scholars basically say there is no such thing as international law because of the, the lack of a, sort of a central uh, enforcement mechanism. You know, national law. We have a, you know, we have a judiciary, we have a police, uh, we have a prison system. So you've got a clear enforcement mechanism there. Uh, that isn't the same in international law. For um, courts to adjudicate, uh, you know, um, disputes between states, those states have to first of all accept the jurisdiction of those tri- tribunals or courts. Um, and a number of states don't, for example, accept the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Or even if they do, they don't accept it. Um, to the extent it would govern things like uses of force. Um, then on, on a different kind of level, you've got, um, we talk about the law of armed conflict, but if you're trying to hold individuals to account, so war crimes, for example, you've got the International Criminal Court. And again, you, uh, states have to accept jurisdiction there. Uh, and you've got controversies because of the way that jurisdiction has been interpreted by the International Criminal Court to 
sort of almost uh, extend beyond what um, states might have thought would be um, permitted jurisdiction. So there's that question of jurisdiction and states have to accept jurisdiction. Um, and then even if you do have uh, a decision made, and you see this with the um, decision with China um, and activities in the South China Sea, had a, a decision there um, that went against them and you know, has, sort of haven't done anything about it. So um, without a sort of you know, supranational police force, there's always that issue of how do you enforce international law. I think that relates relates to the, the the kind of nature of the international legal system as well, where it's states regulating their the relationship with other states. Whereas if you look at it from a domestic uh, perspective, it's the the state of or the UK and how it's seeking to regulate the individuals or companies within its jurisdiction. So it's that kind of distinguishing fact, but there is a a bit of interplay and an overlap between how those two systems work. But so so as to not be overly depressing, you know there is. <laughs> there is pa there is power in being able to say that another state has breached international law um you know w whether people agree with states justifications for example for their use of force um states still try and justify it you know uh, russia went into crimea and it, and it still tried to justify under international law why, why it was able to do so even if it wasn't a very good justification at all but enforcement is difficult but there is still something to be said for you know have i violated international law or not so legally what's the difference between cyber and space you know, and, the, and the frameworks that exist yeah i think it's, it's a good question um in, in the sense that in terms of cyber there's no international treaties that specifically address cyber activity save a, a limited uh, convention that relates to cyber crime um albeit what we would be saying is that general international law um, and how that would apply um, to cyberspace is very relevant. And on the other hand, you've, when you consider space, it's important and it's probably quite widely recognised within some military or those involved within military space operations that there are specific space treaties agreed at the international level that have space um, at, its, at its heart. The most recognised and cornerstone of, of that regime is the Outer Space Treaty from 1967. And that the role that that plays is, is probably one that's that's going to become under increasing scrutiny. I think it's, it's recognised, albeit that the specific terms within it are not well understood and there's maybe a lot of misconceptions. For instance, the extent to which um, it, re it regulates the... Um, the, the use of weapons in space uh, it specifically addresses that in one of its provisions in, in terms of um, the placement of uh, nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction in orbit or being stationed in space um, and it's something that quite often is, is used as a, a broad brush question or statement that weapons aren't allowed in space when that in fact isn't really covered off or, or not well understood. I've got to ask, what is it like to be that person in the room and all the eyes are looking at you for wisdom? Well, they're, they're definitely looking past me, so maybe Stu should answer that question. I think they're also looking past me as well, but <laughs> I, I, I'll, I'll certainly answer the question. I mean, I think that that is part of it, and it maybe goes back to a point I've raised again, that these are not facts that you're, you're considering isolation. Um, but, the law is only one part of it, where you've got operational considerations, you've got policy considerations, and it's things that have been thought about beforehand. Obviously, you're not going to cover every case and every eventuality, but you're hoping that they've already been thought about and the position that the UK or whatever state is involved is, is going to have thought about what it wants to do and what capabilities it can draw on as well. I think there's certainly a bit of responsibility attached to the advice that you provide, uh, and that's where we... we the, the legal branch seeks to kind of provide a, a training platform um, to, to get you ready um, to go on those operations and, and provide the advice. And you've obviously got great colleagues that you can reach back to and, and, and seek advice from, such as um, Kieran, for example. <laughs> did, did either of you work in a civilian legal practice before you joined the Royal Air Force? Yeah, so I... Um... Obviously, being interested in operational law, I previously advised on corporate tax. Uh, so I used to work in the city for uh, an international law firm and would advise on 
things like uh, structured finance and and mergers and acquisitions and and uh, things like that. So very very different. Um, I don't miss it except for the except for the money. <laughs> Uh, so what is the attraction then of being a a lawyer, a legal advisor in the Royal Air Force when you could be working in the city for much more? Uh, I mean, per- this is a very personal answer, but I didn't want to die saying that uh, having a you know, corporate tax advisor on my tombstone was a bit more to life than that. Uh, it, was, it was a great place to train because of the expectations they put on you and the demands they put on you. Uh, and you work very long hours. Um, but but it's a great place to kind of cut your teeth as a, as a lawyer, as a trainee. But um but I, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to do something that uh, felt like there was more of a social benefit, you know, um, achieving achieving something that was of greater benefit than saving large corporations or private equity firms money, basically. So that's how I ended up in the in the Royal Air Force, uh, and it's been great so far. Uh, so, Stu, I don't know if you want to give your your personal experience. Yeah, um, yeah, it's probably picked up from my accent, but I'm. Um... Scottish qualified solicitor, um, and I, I trained and practice up in um, in Scotland before joining the RAF. I think one of the the big attractions from my perspective was, was that opportunity to to travel and see different places, um, and and obviously got my eyes on Kieran's post out in the US, which would be a great place to to live and work, um, but even the opportunity to travel around the UK, I think, was something that was really attractive to me, and 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 going on what Kieran said as well, I think it was. Um, I, I wasn't in a, a, a city firm in London, but I was making modestly rich people modestly more rich doing uh, corporate commercial work up in Glasgow. And as much as I, I quite enjoyed it, I just felt that there was something more and a bigger picture that I could feed into. And it's certainly a decision that I've, I've, I've found greatly rewarding. And uh, advice for someone that was sat in, that's currently sat in your shoes, looking, looking out the window, wondering if there's anything better out there as a lawyer? What's your thoughts? I think you um, you need to have a a long hard think about it because I mean what, there was a period there when I was in private practice where all I was about was you know making partner um, and I don't there wasn't one day where I I realised that I didn't want to stay here stay at my law firm anymore but it kind of slowly dawned on me it was it's actually kind of scary because I was like well hang on I had this one goal almost and and now I, d- I don't even know what I want to do um, and I ended up deciding to, to join the Air Force. And I can honestly say that I've never been more um, concerned than the morning um, I went to go do my kind of officer selection and I found out whether they were going to sort of t- um, keep me on in the process or not because I didn't really have a plan B. <laughs> um, so I was very glad um, that, that that went okay. But they need to think about what they're doing now and, and really what they want to be, what they, they think they, they want to do in terms of contributing to, you know, national uh, defense uh, to operations abroad and you know as everyone's listening probably to this this uh, podcast realizes you know being in the military has a very particular lifestyle it's not for everyone um, but for those who think they might be interested it's you know it is an absolutely fantastic career and you have some great opportunities particularly in our legal branch and this isn't just me you know spinning spinning a tail uh, when I look back I really took a leap of faith I don't think I fully understood what I was getting myself in for um and, and it worked out. Um, so what I would say is that if you are interested then, and you want to contact the legal branch, we always are happy to sort of speak to people to sort of give them a bit more information. And the future for Royal Air Force Legal Services, you know, what, what do you think you'll be focused on in 20 years' time? You're still young enough to be serving. <laughs> I, I will be. I'm not sure about Kieran. Um, I, I think in, in, in terms of the future, I think it's... It's that move, and it's probably outlined within the the inter- integrated operating concept uh, and also the integrated review. And it's this understanding we've mentioned it before about operating below the zone, so below the the, the zone of armed conflict. So very much that is our uh, the kind of fundamental reason why we are in uniform. But I think it's then recognising that the military will have potentially a, a role and function below that zone, and it's providing the legal advice that that. that beyond just the, the core LOAC scenarios that we've discussed. Um, but it's the, the fact that we're, we're going to be involved probably in a much wider sphere of activities, making sure that the law, uh, that the UK uh, and the armed forces and the RAF 
uh, what they're doing is complying with their obligations in, under both international law and domestic law. So I think there's there's that angle to what we do. I think we'll, we'll still seek to serve in very similar ways and it's providing that uh, operationally focused uh, legal advice. Yeah, and you're going to have, um, you know, we, we see trends like increasing autonomy in, in military platforms, you know, uh, an increasing focus in the UK on, on uh, outer space, increasing use of cyber from, from non-state and state actors. So all of these things are going to, uh, they're all relevant, but they all coalesce as well. Um, so from an operational perspective, th this is the thing that I think the branches, the legal branch has been excellent, actually, uh, not to toot to, to, to the <laughs> my training commands horn too much. But in terms of like for, for seeing this come, you know, coming, uh, and getting people who who are suitably qualified to be able to deal with it, and sort of training people. Um, so we have to keep an eye on you know how things develop. But you know, we've now got a law in space command, and um, so as these trends continue, you know we'll keep an eye on it. But everyone's bad at predicting the next conflict. So the US are talking about uh, major competitors, but you know, the next thing might be something kicks off in in Central Africa or Southern Africa, and you, you never know. Um, and increasingly, you've got huge metropolitan areas and we're seeing that urban warfare the difficulties that gives rise to so there's always the next thing to consider. Squadron Leader Kieran, Squadron Leader Stu, it's been illuminating to speak with you both on Inside Air. I really appreciate the time you've given and the education that you've provided to our listeners and to me. I, I feel I understand a bit more now look forward to the next time I go to Shrivenham for another brief. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. This is Reheat on Inside Air. I'm LAC Victoria Andrews. Instructors, engineers and support staff from ORAF Benson have arrived at the Naval Air Facility in Southern California to prepare for the start of Exercise Imperial Zephyr. The exercise provides Puma Force crews with the opportunity to gain essential environmental qualifications in a number of different conditions, such as day and night flight and hot and dusty environments with desert and mountainous terrain. This training ensures crews are ready to deploy at short notice anywhere in the world. Elsewhere, a new fleet of aircraft rescue and firefighting vehicles have begun service at ORAF Bryce Norton. They'll replace an ageing fleet and are designed with a number of new capabilities. The Oskosh Striker is the standout piece of new kit, weighing in at an impressive 42,000 kg, or the equivalent of seven bull elephants. One of the most impressive new features is the extendable water foam and dry powder delivery system called a high reach extendable turret. This turret also has a nozzle which can cut through the skin of an aircraft, allowing firefighters to introduce a sprinkler system into the aircraft before teams enter to carry out rescue operations. And finally, a physics undergraduate at St Andrews University and Scottish and GB international hockey player has put down her books and hockey stick to join 603 Squadron in Edinburgh as an RAF regiment reservist. AC Emily Dark excelled during the basic recruit training course at RAF Halton, winning both the Top Recruit and Top Shot awards. AC Dark will continue her Phase 2 training at the City of Edinburgh Squadron. That's Reheat on Inside Air. I'm SAC Simon Ross with this episode's Name That Noise. That was the sound of an RAF Falcons parachute display team member pulling their ripcord and gliding perfectly through the sky during a practice jump. The Falcon's exciting free fall display, which includes advanced manoeuvres, falling with style at speeds of up to 120 miles per hour, and their famous unique non-contact canopy stack captivate spectators at venues all over the UK and Europe. Based at RAF Prize Norton in Oxfordshire, the team of 12 parachute jump instructors, supported by their own dedicated survival equipment fitters, this year celebrate their 60th anniversary. The team was originally formed in 1961 by six instructors from the Parachute Training School at RAF Abingdon. 
they were nicknamed the Big Six as most of the members were shorter than 5 foot 6 inches. The Big Six were later renamed the RAF Falcons, taking inspiration from the bird of prey which best represented their displays. Swift, swooping, elegant and aerobatic in flight. That's all for this episode of Inside Air. Please give us a review and subscribe on your favourite podcast app and join us again soon. You've been listening to Inside Air, a behind-the-wire view of the Royal Air Force, its people, technology and operations. If you're serving in the RAF and have a story for us, please speak to your unit media and communications officer. Inside Air is written and produced for the Royal Air Force by RAF Media Reserves.